Chinese President Xi Jinping has wrapped up a state visit to Russia at the invitation of his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin. It was President Xi's first overseas trip since being elected Chinese president for a third term earlier this month. And the visit came amid intensifying geopolitical tensions worldwide, especially the escalating Ukraine crisis. On Tuesday, the two leaders signed two joint statements, one reaffirming the partnership between China and Russia and the other setting out plans for stronger economic cooperation. Are China and Russia creating a new global order that poses threat to the world as claimed by the mainstream media in the West? How should people properly understand the close relationship between the two sides and what's been achieved on bringing an end to the Ukraine crisis? Welcome to a special edition of The Point with me, Li Xin, coming to you live from Beijing. I'm pleased to be joined from Moscow, Russia, by Andrei Kortnov, Academic Director of the Russian International Affairs Council, or RIAC, and from Belgrade, Serbia, Yaroslav Lisovolik, a member of RIAC. From Shanghai, by Huang Jing, University Professor and Director of the Institute of U.S. and Pacific Studies for the Shanghai International Studies University, and last but not least, here in the studio, by Cui Hongjian, Director of the Department for European Studies from the China Institute of International studies gentlemen welcome to this very special edition of the point um, first of all let me go to Andre in Moscow now the two sides have said that Russia needs a prosperous and stable China and China needs a strong and successful Russia how do you interpret that what's the bilateral and multilateral context of this visit well, I think that everybody needs a, a prosperous China, since uh, China is a major driver of uh, the global economy, uh, and uh, a lot in the world depends on the economic performance uh, of the People's Republic of China. Uh, however, one can also add uh, that Russia and uh, China can complement each other economically. Uh, Russia needs China, especially now with all the international sanctions imposed on Moscow by the West. Uh, but China also needs Russia. Uh, Russia might be an important source uh, for the Chinese development. Uh, so, uh, in a way, uh, this relationship uh, is natural and organic, and uh, I think uh, that uh, the two sides uh, practically do not compete with each other. Uh, therefore, there is a natural uh, complementarity in this relationship. Um, Professor Huang, how do you look at the strategic complementarity of the two sides? Because President Xi also talking talk about strategic logic of this uh, partnership. I think strategic logic lays in three areas. Number one, like uh, Andrew just said, is uh, economically, the two countries are complementary to each other. And if the two countries have a good and sound economy, that would be a great contribution, not only to the two countries' economy, but to the rest of the world. Second, that both Russia and China are members of the Security Council of the United Nations. If they stand together, then at least uh, we can keep some kind of stability in the world because they're too strong to be challenged militarily and economically. Last but not the least, of course, the two countries present some different ways of life or different ways of development, which are, you know, uh, are now is opposed by the West. But I think that this kind of competition between the two parts of the world is not really bad in, in terms that we live in a very diversified world. And uh, there's only there should be you know options for for every country to choose what kind of way they want to go, and I think that provides you know a kind of diversity for this mm. world, which I think is necessary for us to live a normal life as as human beings. Well, um, Mr. Tui, well, that would lead to some of the questions uh, people have in the West. For instance, that uh, Russia and China are converging to. Uh, form a kind of alliance or a camp that's opposed to the West. Uh, as we have heard, for instance, over the past few weeks, the, weeks, the United States has warned about the visit that China could potentially supply Russia with lethal support. Uh, and the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak also talked about Russia and China threatened to create global danger and disorder. Uh, why there is so much skepticism? Is there any legitimacy in that? Also, you know, even uh, both China and Russia, they confirm uh, again and again that uh, this uh, cooperation between two countries will not target any uh, third party, but always, as we know, some Western countries 
tried to, to be part of the China-Russia relations, especially recently also in the, in the background of the uh, Ukrainian crisis. Uh, for some European countries, they do have some uh, you know, worry about this so called possible alliance between China and Russia. But I think it's just a, a limitation of this uh, Western countries' uh, uh, historic uh, experience. Uh, also, you know, from this uh, little, little sum game, uh, always they think that uh, any kind of uh, close relations between China and Russia will do something bad to so-called dominated Western countries' uh, uh, position in the international order. So I think now the very big question is we need to take, make it clear that uh, uh, what's the uh, uh, effect of this uh, cooperation between China and Russia to the real world order or just a uh, order dominated or uh, obey, to, obey to some uh, so-called rule uh, of uh, Western countries. Once we uh, make clear this question, I think that uh, uh, no matter what happened between China and Russia, how close of the, these uh, relations, uh, certainly there will be more contribution to the stability of the real world order. But of course, perhaps it will be, there will be some uh, maybe bad effect to so-called uh, the world order dominated by Western countries. Mm. Let's, let's take a look at the economic and trade perspective once again. And Yaroslav, uh, you are more an expert in this part. Why do you think the two sides need each other ever more, given the rapid expansion of trade over the past decade? Why the heightened importance? Well, I think there are a lot of uh, reasons. And uh, one of the reasons, of course, is that uh, both Russia and China are major uh, players uh, in the world economy. And uh, China has made tremendous strides uh, in the course of the past several decades in uh, becoming essentially one of the key leaders uh, of the world economy. Russia clearly is very important in some of the uh, very uh, key elements uh, of uh, the world economy in key spheres such as agriculture, such as energy, etc. So there is this complementarity that has already been noted in our discussion earlier that needs to be exploited. And another aspect, of course, is that uh, throughout the past several decades, we're seeing increasing intensity and increasing frequency of crises, financial crises emanating from developed economies. And uh, clearly, one of the ways to uh, shield uh, the economies of uh, the global south and uh, the economies of Russia and China uh, from these negative impulses is to uh, develop mutual trade, mutual investment. And this so far is still well below potential and there's tremendous room to further make gains in terms of boosting uh, mutual trade. Mm -hmm. um Andre, let's go back to the larger picture of international order. I mean, the West, the US-led West talk about China and Russia trying to um, change the international order that has been formed after the Second World War, calling, it revi calling us revisionists to powers and so on and so forth. But President Xi, while meeting with Mr. Putin, did talk about um, a global order that is uh, answering to the growing expectations of the international community. Uh, exactly what are we looking at and from, who's, from the Global South perspective? What is China trying to achieve with Russia together in that regard? Well, the world order is likely to change. Uh, it uh, cannot uh, remain the same uh, since the balance of powers in the world uh, is changing quite rapidly. Uh, also, we have a challenge of global commons, and we see that uh, China is uh, uh, positioning itself as a true global power right now. Uh, for instance, uh, China is actively involved uh, in international uh, peacekeeping and mediation uh, the uh, recent uh, Saudi-Iranian deal brokered by China was a shock uh, to many Western scholars and uh, politicians uh, because uh, they're used to thinking that only the United States, only the West uh, can mediate uh, such major international agreements. I think that uh, Moscow and Beijing uh, uh, agree uh, that uh, the international order uh, has uh, to be reviewed and uh, to be revised so that it will be more representative, uh, more inclusive, and more democratic. The question is how we move in this direction, whether we can avoid uh, a series of uh, major international crises, 
on the way to this new world order. And I think that uh, both uh, Beijing and Moscow uh, think that uh, it would uh, be better to provide uh, for a gradual and staged uh, transition, though this transition will not be easy in any case. Mm. Professor Huang, how do you look at the reaction from the United States? Uh, for instance, uh, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, calling China's visit, uh, President Xi's visit to Russia, a diplomatic cover for Russia. Does that tell us about the kind of uh, uh, jittery or, or nervousness or skepticism that the United States has about what China plans to achieve together with Russia? I think obviously the United States is not very comfortable for this visit. First and foremost, the United States actually is one of the major drivers for the uh, uh, existing Ukraine crisis. And they always believe that the United States should be dominant on how this crisis goes and how this crisis should be solved. And the President Xi Jinping's visit to Russia obviously provide a kind of possibility that this crisis will be ended, not in America's terms, first and foremost. And that, of course, is not in America's interest. But I want to go back to the so-called international order the United States emphasized so much in this attack in, on, Russia, on China and Russia. I think this international order is not defined as the United States uh, does. It is, in my view, uh, you know, supported by three pillars. Number one is the United Nations, it's a political order. Number two is the WTO and so on so forth, structured for the trade, uh, economic and the trade order. Number three, of course, is the World Bank and the IMF, which regulate our financial order. All the three pillars, as we know, are based on multilateral arrangements. That's why China, as well as Russia, is uphold uh, multilateralism in international affairs. But the United States, of course, is going for uh, utilateralism. And that's a problem because this international order, as defined by the United States, has become more and more an instrument for the United States to maintain its kind of hegemony, which is against not only the interests of the world, but also against America itself. It's very ironic. In that regard, I think this visit of President Xi Jinping to Moscow is kind of demonstration that international order must be remain, must be you know maintained, but not in a kind of way defined by United States and dominated by mm. United States. That's not the way to go. Yeah, let's let's go back to bilateral ties, and I want to go to uh, uh, Andre once again because you are only staying with us for a short period of time. Um, you know, we the, the Western press had a lot of problem with the term that China's partnership with Russia had no limits, which was what was uttered in uh, uh, during the Winter Olympics last year. Now, uh, at this visit, uh, how do you look at the description by the two sides of this relationship? Of course, we're not seeing the repetition of such wording such as no limits. How do you look at uh, the description of the bilateral relationship this time? Well, I think that this trip uh, and uh, the document signed uh, uh, by uh, uh, the two leaders uh, suggest uh, that uh, the uh, China-Russia relationship is very unique. Uh, it's not a formal military or political alliance. Uh, at the same time, uh, it is something that we can define as a true strategic partnership. Uh, and indeed, uh, there are no limits in the sense that uh, there is uh, a huge untapped potential uh, in the economic field, in the political domain, uh, in the social interaction. And uh, I think we can all hope uh, that uh, this trip uh, will be a major catalyst for uh, bringing this relationship uh, to a new level. So it is an important trip, uh, and I think that future historians uh, will definitely record this trip uh, in, in their books. Mm. Uh, Professor Sui, your take on the question? Do you agree? Yes, we can find out uh, some uh, different uh, definition about the China-Russia relations from uh, no limit to recently uh, repeated. Uh, how about no uh, uh, alliance, no uh, confrontation, and then not uh, targeting any third party. I think it's right a uh, very normal situation for these uh, battle relations. As we know, the so-called no limits means that uh, there will be no any limitation for the cooperation uh, between two countries once there are some uh, uh, mutual understanding and the mutual trust and also mutual requirement. But at, at the first, at the, on the other hand, as we know, uh, this uh, uh, relations between China and Russia is a relations between two big countries, and it will have some more uh, spillover effect uh, to a region, regional and global level. So uh, it, it's, it's very necessary for both the countries to reaffirm their you know, cooperation will be line to the world order and especially to the constructive uh, effect to deal with any conflict. 
So I think it's a right to uh, a uh, very uh, rational range for these uh, bilateral relations. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it will give a more positive message to the international community. Okay, we'll take a short break. And uh, when we come back, we will have uh, Professor Liang Yen from the uh, from a U.S. university. Many thanks to Andrei Kortunov from the Russian International Affairs Council. The other guests will stay with us. We'll take a short break. We'll be back right after that. Welcome back. We are nearly joined by Professor Liang Yen, Kramer Chair, Professor of Economics at uh, William Met University, joining us from the United States. Welcome, Professor Liang. And uh, let's continue our discussion more on the economic and trade front, as we understand the two sides uh, also signed a joint uh, statement on mm -hmm. economic and uh, on economic cooperation up to 2030, in which the both sides uh, pledge to carry out economic cooperation in multiple key directions including expanding the trade scale, optimizing the trade structure, and developing e-commerce and other innovative modes of cooperation. Yaroslav, what does that mean, and uh, what are some of the obstacles? Do you think this visit will help clear some of those obstacles? Absolutely. I think uh, this is uh, indeed a breakthrough visit in many respects in terms of boosting the economic cooperation between the two countries. This is a major milestone in terms of uh, the process of building uh, the bilateral economic relationship. And I think, in, in a way, it goes from quantity to quality this time around. Uh, previously, in the preceding years, we've seen a particular emphasis placed on reaching certain numerical goals in uh, bilateral trade. And one of the most recent ones was the $200 billion target for uh, mutual trade between Russia and China that mm -hmm. is almost reached, was almost reached last year, and is, uh, I think, almost certain to be exceeded in the course of uh, this year. But the qualitative aspect this time around, I think, is that there is a particular emphasis that is placed on developing technology sectors, high-tech sectors, on boosting investment cooperation as to overcome some of the bottlenecks that uh, still exist um, in uh, boosting bilateral trade. You need more connectivity, you need more infrastructure, and that is attained through greater investment in order for mutual trade, whether in the energy sector or in other sectors, to expand more forcefully. So I think the, the, the diagnosis and the decisions that were made and the declarations that were made are very much on target. Hmm. Um, Professor Huang, um, how important is trade with Russia for China? Uh, the, the amount itself is not that huge, as we know, uh, compared to the overall import and export volume of China. And yet, it seems that China places a lot of importance on that. And what explains the takeoff of trade between the two sides after their political relationship has gone on uh, very well for quite some year now? It seems that finally trade is catching up. Again, we know that uh, China, uh, the mission of China is to, you know, to become a strong nation on us, in which China has to sustain its development, which means China need uh, affordable and uh, reliable supply of energy and other major resources. And uh, as a number one trading power and also number one manufacturer on us, China needs indeed not only energy, but other, you know, uh, large uh, commodities, uh, uh, which Russia can play a very important a role in, in this. And second, we have to realize that although United States and other Western countries launched the all front sanctions against Russia, but all the countries that participate in the sanction against Russia are global North countries, about 47, 48 of them. Mm -hmm. The entire global South refused to join the sanction, which means a close cooperation and enlargement and further increase of the cooperation between two largest economies in the global South will have enormous impact, not only on the two countries, not only on the global South economy, but will also have, I believe, a positive impact on global North, given that both Russia and especially China are deeply integrated in the global economy. So we have to look at a larger picture of the two countries' cooperation. I think it's not only going to strengthen both China and Russia's position in the global economy, but also a positive contribution to our world economy that is more and more kind of, you know, in a demand of resources and, and other things. 
Let's talk about the, the conflict in Ukraine, which is high on the uh, attention list of uh, many media in the West. Of course, it's also high, um, discussed in the joint news conference, for instance. Mr. Putin said many provisions of the Chinese peace plan can be taken as basis for settling the conflict in Ukraine whenever the West and Kyiv are ready for it. Um, Mr. Tsui, do you see China uh, being more emboldened to play the role of a mediator or is China is giving out its principled position on this more clearly? How do you look at China's uh, vision now vis-a-vis -vis how vis-a-vis -vis its potential role in the Ukraine crisis? Actually, the even since the uh, uh, breakout of the Ukraine crisis in last year, China did a lot to help the situation, especially to turning back to the negotiation and the diplomatic solution. Uh, I think recently China uh, released its uh, document on its uh, stance uh, towards the uh, Ukrainian crisis. And this time, I think the uh, President Xi's visit to Russia will be very, very important step for any kind of uh, mediation or effort by Chinese government to help the situation. As we know, uh, this complex, complicated situation in Ukraine uh, should not get a, a simple answer, just like uh, President Xi mentioned. But we need, to, we need to do something right now. I think the first time for China and Russia, it's a good time to have a deep uh, communication uh, to know what's the real understanding, the real mm. uh, purpose of uh, Russia. And it will give a very big help for China to share it with some other uh, leaders. As we know, uh, this year, China will have some more uh, high level exchange with uh, more countries. I think uh, right, it's the right time for China to contribute more. But of course, okay. China will take its uh, own way, but of course, mm -hmm. accompanied with a major uh, member of the uh, international community mm -hmm. to help the situation. Yeah, Professor Liang, how do you look at uh, the uh, skepticism and also the criticism that, for instance, China's diplomacy is lopsided, China is much closer to Russia than it seems China is to Ukraine, and therefore China is not in a good position to uh, serve as an honest broker. How do you look at these uh, voices on the media you're seeing? Yeah, good to talk to you, Liu Xing. So first of all, I think, you know, from Putin's words, you know, China has taken a well-balanced stance um, in the midst of this. And from the very beginning, China is trying to play a, you know, peace mediator, um, trying to end the war. Um, and it's very important also, I think President Xi has expressed very clearly that there is profound historical logic um, for China to form the strategic partnership with Russia. Um, because, you know, both sides share a lot of common interests, peaceful development, you know, regional security and peace and uh, economic development. So I think there are a lot of reasons why, you know, these strategic partnerships and coordinations are very important um, for both countries. And so going back to what you, um, you know, talked about earlier, I think it's very important for China to play a peace broker role um, as China is being a very responsible stakeholder and China has experienced uh, in the recent, uh, you know, just weeks, right, that the successful broker, uh, brokerage of a peace deal, you know, between Saudi Arabia and Iran. So I think there's a lot of hope. Um, and I think, you know, the West is uh, jumping to the conclusion about, you know, China's ill intention, I think is very misleading and it's very uh, distortive. Professor Huang, uh, some people do have questions and sometimes it is not too difficult to to um, think that way. For instance, look, in the West's eye, uh, Russia is a country that that is an aggressor in this, uh, in this conflict. And by going to Moscow at this moment, China is seen to embolden Russia, to at least provide moral support to Russia. Um, how can that, how in that way can China help uh, uh, Russia end the uh, military operation on the front line China is calling for ceasefire. Um, Professor Huang, how do you look at that kind of argument? How would you explain to those in the West who see China's visit as endorsing Mr. Putin, who has, for instance, uh, recently been uh, issued an arrest warrant by the International Criminal Court, despite the United States not respecting this court at its convenience? First and foremost, we have to understand that China's uh, uh, President Xi Jinping's visit to Russia and trying to strengthen the relationship between the two countries does not mean China endorses ongoing war in Ukraine. Uh, that's exactly why China, the, exactly why China, uh, Xi Jinping went, went to Moscow to try to broke a peace, just like we discussed before. China is always against confrontation, 
uh, between countries, and also China against to secure one country's security at the expenses of others. And also another thing is that there are different narratives and understandings or explanations of how, how this war broke out in the first place. Of course, we know the narrative that another narrative, which is quite popular in the global south, is that the expansion, west eastward expansion of NATO put pressure on Russia, and, and, and number one, number two, this war actually started as early as 2014. Uh, not just in 2022. Mm -hmm. And uh, the final point that we have to, and Western world has to understand that is China perhaps is the only power that can play a role of mediator in this conflict. If they need a mediator, China is the only one because the other powers are not, you know, are, 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 are either too insignificant in this or has been involved in this conflict. So I think that China can and should make a positive contribution okay. to end this war peacefully, but not yeah. in anybody's term, of course. All right. Um, Yaroslav, uh, from a Russian perspective, how is China's role in this regard perceived in Russia? Keep it short, please. Yes, my sense is that uh, China has already been uh, successful in brokering accords on the international arena, and the fact that it is coming up with proposals that are uh, potentially, um, you know, solving uh, the issue, I think, is very important. Um, I think uh, it's very important that this initiative on the part of China is discussed actively by the global community and this greater activism of China on the international stage is, I think, a, a very welcome trend. All right. Uh, we have to leave it there. Um, of course, at this moment, we do not have concrete so-called peace plan proposed by China. We have to be very cautious how to move forward. Many thanks to my guests, uh, um, Yaroslav Lisovolik joining us from Serbia, Huang Jing joining us from Shanghai, Cui Hongjin joining us here in the studio, and uh, Professor Liang Yan joining us from um, the United States, Portland, the United States. Thank you all very much.